Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to magical lands far beneath the depths of our ordinary world as we relax with a retelling of Jules Verne's famous tale, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Before we begin our peaceful meander beneath the waves to visit the Nautilus, let us take a moment to find peace and comfort in the place that we are in here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into whatever soft surface you are sleeping on. Here and now, there is no to-do list. There are no responsibilities. There are no obligations. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, by joining me on this serene journey, You are already giving your body the gift of rest and relaxation. Anything else that you are seeking will come in time. But for now, trust that you are doing more than enough. With your eyes still closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper into a comfortable position, I'd like you to try to picture something with me. You were laying in the warm sand of a remote beach on a perfect summer day. You can feel the warmth of the sand on the palms of your hands, your arms, your back, your legs, your feet, even your neck working away any tension that you were carrying there. The sound of seagulls flying overhead and the rhythmic beats of the ocean waves urge you to settle in to the serene moment in time, to simply be with no expectations. And slowly, the motion and life of the world around you truly settles into you. The cool waves glide up onto the shore, carrying with them a blanket of colorful seashells and ocean treasures. You are just far enough up the beach so the waves don't drench you. Instead, They lightly brush against the ends of your toes, pulling your entire body off in one beautiful wave of sensation. The golden sunlight warms you as the waves scurry back to the sea. And by the time they return again, you are ready for the icy touch of the sea foam and the clicking and clacking of shells as they reach a happy resting point. As the waves rush in to brush over your feet, you find yourself tensing your legs and hips. The cool water cascades over them, and then, after hovering over you for one brief and beautiful beat. The tide returns back to the sea. As it does, you release the tension in your legs, feeling a wave of total and complete relaxation come over them. As the waves begin to make their way back towards you, you tense your abs your torso, and your shoulders. The cool water washes over them, hovers for that flickering moment of serenity, 
and then glides out to sea as the waves roll off of your skin you release the tension in your torso you sink deeper into the sand as all the tension in your body melts away when the tide returns to kiss the shore yet again you tense your neck arms and jaw as tightly as you can the fresh water of the ocean brushes over your shoulders your neck and your arms only in this moment of tension do you realize how much you are carrying within yourself the waves retreat and as they do you release your muscles the stress is carried away by the cool waves and all that you are left with is the warmth of the sun shining down on your skin if at any point during your journey tonight feel like you could use some extra relaxation know that you can always visit this beach where the dancing waves can give your body some well-deserved relief now that we have taken the time to find peace and comfort in the place that we are in here and now let us begin our story the summer of 1866 was a strange one it was not just due to the sweltering heat that rippled through the countryside of france leaving many farmers fanning themselves beneath the bountiful trees in their rolling fields it was not just due to the rain that came in the days after that soaking the streets of Paris as residents sipped on their café au lait and spoke to each other in hushed tones. No, the summer of 1866 was a strange one because of what those Parisians spoke of in their hushed tones. Around the world, American and European sailors reported seeing something in the water that they had never experienced before. Something enormous that put them on edge. Sure, they had seen their fair share of blue whales basking out of the water and in the sun with such a grand size that it was hard to believe it was a living thing. But this was wildly different the size of this thing this oddity was beyond anything they had ever seen before it was faster than any known creature on earth and capable of shooting columns of water 150 feet up into the air Anyone who had seen it and made it back to shore to tell tales of it had a certain magic in their eye when they spoke of the columns of water, the creature, the thing, pulsed into the air. It was like a geyser. The geysers of faraway Iceland or the wilds of Russia but it was even taller it cast a mist into the air that was otherworldly engulfing any boat that crossed its path in gossamer of rainbow and white it was like walking through a dream world dr pierre aranac had heard many tales of this strange monster as summer turned to autumn autumn turned to winter and winter turned to spring in fact 
He looked for these stories everywhere he went. He'd wait by the docks, desperate to speak to any sailors that had caught a glimpse of it. At the Museum of Natural History, where he served as the assistant professor, he spent many days in deep discussion with his co-workers about what the creature could possibly be. Though, no matter what anyone else said, Pierre's mind was made up. He believed the mystery could be explained, like any good scientist. When Pierre was asked, he would tell anyone that would listen that he believed the mystery in the water was either a colossal monster or an enormous submarine. As much as his colleagues fed into his beliefs, the various governments of the world did little to agree with him. They rejected the idea that it could be a submarine, the technology and engineering required to create such a vast, impressive craft would be nearly impossible. Stumped by the mystery, and desperate for a more scientific explanation, Pierre curled up by the fire one day with a steaming cup of Earl Grey tea. As the fragrant smell of the tea melded with the warm aroma of the cracking wood, Pierre found himself slipping into a new explanation. He wrote swiftly, his fingers clasped around his dip pen as though the secrets of the universe were dripping off of its tip in thick, black droplets of ink. When he was finished, he had no idea how much impact his words would have. Pierre proposed that the creature behind these sightings was none other than a large narwhal that had yet to be discovered by humans. Pierre could imagine a narwhal somewhere beneath the depths, gliding through the water with graceful ease and speed to reach the glistening tops of the waves. Fortunately, Pierre wasn't the only one who saw this as a possibility. When the US government read his convincing article, they decided it was time to get to the bottom of this strange mystery. They deployed the Abraham Lincoln, a frigate, to search the vast oceans to catch a glimpse of the creature and determine its origin. Invited aboard for the journey, Pierre gratefully accepted and climbed aboard the ship. His servant, Conseil, packed his belongings with haste. He could already taste the fresh ocean air and imagine the tropical islands that they would glide by all around the world in search of the answer to this mystery. When Pierre and Conseil stepped aboard the frigate, they felt a sense of belonging and relief. It was a fine ship, crafted fairly recently, and it cut through the water with such ease. Pierre was certain no creature or thing could be a match for it. Commander Farragut welcomed Pierre with a warm smile and showed him to his cabin, a cozy, lamp-lit room with plenty of space for him to place his books and other belongings. He loved the smell of books almost as much as he loved the briny aroma of the wide open seas. His first day spent meandering around the ship and gazing out 
out at New York Harbor, fading into the distance. He could already feel the wistful sensation in him, rising from the embers of his boyhood dreams of adventure and fame. Ned Land, the finest harpooner in the world, greeted Pierre with a smile, thankful to hear a French accent. A Canadian from Quebec, his French heritage ran deep, and it felt like being at home, speaking to someone from his motherland. Ned, Pierre, and Conseil spoke on the top of the deck to one another for what felt like hours in the breeze of the wide open sea. They gazed out over the horizon as they grew nearer and nearer to it, their conversation growing more intellectual and emotional with every passing moment. They were eager to catch sight of the creature beneath the waves, but as time passed, it seemed less and less likely. The ship crossed the deep blue of the Atlantic, sailing on fair winds. The crew took turns keeping watch from the deck, but as the weeks turned to months, their vigor only lessened more and more. Pierre found himself daydreaming most days, as did Conseil, who told Pierre the two should be back in the halls of the Natural History Museum, classifying fossils. Indeed, Pierre did miss everything about the museum. The rich mahogany shelves, the endless samples of the natural world, the smell of the book on display, and of warm tea being brewed by other intelligent minds. After months of no luck spotting anything on Abraham Lincoln, it seemed as if they were never going to come upon the discovery that they were seeking. But as they rounded Cape Horn, heading for the China Seas, a voice echoed through the corridors from above deck. It was Ned, calling out that he saw a creature in the distance. Even from afar, Pierre could tell that he had never seen anything like this before. In fact, he would never have thought such a thing existed. By his perception, it appeared to be an electric narwhal. Lights flickered off the grey sides, sending tunnels of light through the dark water. The filtered light would have been beautiful, had Pierre known what exactly was causing it. The ship's crew spent the long day gliding through the water, after the strange electric narwhal. It was evasive, faster than anyone had ever witnessed before, and the glowing lights were so perplexing that Pierre found himself forgetting that it could potentially be dangerous. Crew members harpooned the creature, shot at the creature, and yet, nothing seemed to affect him. It sailed around them with ease, bopping in and out of the water, and flashing its lights in strange, mesmerizing patterns. When the beast finally seemed to quiet, its lights off, and its body still and moving with the tide, Ned knew what his next move had to be. He threw his harpoon through the air, but the sound that echoed off of the creature 
wasn't that of a living thing. Before Pierre could react, the creature let out two enormous spouts of water aimed directly at Abraham Lincoln. It was such a display of power and beauty that Pierre found himself gazing at it in dumbfounded silence. The towers of water were impossibly powerful, and yet here they were, defying all logic and jetting through the air. They left a trail of rainbows behind them in the coruscating light, something that would have been breathtakingly beautiful had it not been pointed directly at Pierre. His feet disappeared from under him. It was nothing but the sound of the water hitting him, and then the sound of him hitting the water. The silence of the ocean that washed over him was like entering another world. For a flickering, serene moment, there was nothing but him floating in a distant land. There was the familiar rumble of the water in his ears, the rhythmic beating of his heart, and the cool, brisk feeling of the sea welcoming him into the waves. When he opened his eyes, he discovered Conseil staring back at him in the water. He had jumped after Pierre, unable to bear the thought of him wading in the ocean alone. The sight of a friend in such an unfamiliar place sent a feeling of warmth radiating through Pierre, one that brought him a sense of safety as the cold waves knocked him about. The two took turns swimming in the water, clinging to one another to conserve energy. The touch of a long-trusted friend made the situation at hand much more bearable. And as their ship disappeared into the distance ahead of them, they knew they needed one another more than ever. Soon, however, Pierre found himself slipping. One moment he was swimming, and the next he found himself in darkness and peaceful silence. In the blink of an eye, he found himself laying on something metallic. Ned and Conseil stood over him, delighted to see him awake. Pierre felt the metal surface beneath him in long, curious strokes. It was only then that he realized they were laying on top of the beast. Only, in this case, the beast was not a beast at all. They were laying on top of a submarine. By then, night had begun to fall. The last rays of light painted the horizon and sea before them in a mosaic of orange, purples, reds, and yellows. It was as if the universe was highlighting the grand discovery that they had just made. The three recovered from their time in the water and gazed at the stars overhead watching in awe as they passed theories back and forth between one another. As morning broke, they found themselves in a new light. The seas were flat and calm, ignited a fiery red and orange by the rising sun. Slowly, the ship beneath them began to descend into the waves, Desperate not to go into the water again, Ned stomped on the top of the ship, revealing a passageway into the machine itself. 
eight men arose from the darkness of the ship, their faces masked, and their gestures in a trained unison with one another. They took Pierre, Ned, and Conseil beneath the hull of the ship as it sank beneath the waves. In the darkness, Pierre focused on the rhythmic clicking of the ship to bring himself peace. He wondered how a ship of this magnitude could run, how it was possible to create a thing of such strength and beauty. Soon, however, the darkness was chased out by a comforting flash of light. A bright bulb illuminated the room around them, revealing chairs and a table. Two men swiftly glided into the room, their outfits unlike anything Pierre had ever seen, and their language unlike anything he had heard. They did not understand English, German, French, nor Latin, and the language they spoke of sounded nothing like either of them. With a shrug of their shoulders, the two men exited, sending a steward in after them. Without so much as saying a word, the steward dressed the table in a fine cloth and dutifully placed engraved plates and utensils atop the threads. He handed each of the men a fresh set of clothes before he returned with a delicious meal. The aroma of the seafood nearly brought Pierre to his knees. He had never seen food this succulent, nor this high quality. In fact, he had never seen food like this before. He could tell it came from the ocean, but the fresh, buttery taste of the meat was better than the finest seafood he had ever eaten. Whoever lived aboard this vessel did not do so without life's finest pleasures. With their stomachs full and their bodies exhausted by the ordeal of the past few hours, the three sailors gradually found themselves drifting to sleep in this strange new world. It came slowly over them, a much-needed warm blanket of comfort after spending time aboard the top of the vessel with such uncertainty. As Pierre awakened the following day, the curiosity welling inside him felt as if it were going to spill out. Soon, Nemo, the captain of the ship, walked through the door with an unreadable look on his face. Though earlier he had pretended not to know French, now he spoke in perfect French to the prisoners aboard his majestic, wondrous ship. He told the men that they could live on his ship, free to roam it as they pleased. However, they were never allowed to leave the ship. If they did not choose to stay, they would be cast out into the sea, where the waves surely wouldn't be kind to them. Pierre ached for the provincial fields of France, for the smell of the lavender in the air, for the crunch of his baker's freshly baked croissants. And yet, he knew he had no choice. The three men agreed to stay aboard the ship and follow Nemo's rules. Pierre's scientific mind was hard at work, desperate to learn every single fascinating detail about the ship that he possibly could. Delighted by the new additions to the Nautilus, his submarine, 
Nemo invited Pierre to join him on a tour of the ship. Bright-eyed and eager, Pierre agreed, his mind already spinning with colorful ideas of the secrets that lay behind each door on the ship. When they emerged into the library of the ship, Pierre was greeted by the familiar smell of old books. It put him at ease in this wondrous and strange place, and he discovered that he couldn't stop smiling. The library was perhaps the largest he had ever seen. Books extended to the ceiling and to either side of the massive room, creating a wall of knowledge built by some of the greatest minds in the world. In a dreamy state, Pierre brushed his fingers over the books as he drifted past them. The soft leather of the books nearly took his breath away, and one glistening title after another caught his eye. It was one of the finest things he had ever seen in his life. The wealth of knowledge in this single room was more vast than anywhere on earth that he knew of. Nemo smiled at Pierre's mesmerized expression. If he was this impressed by the books, his excitement was only about to grow. Nemo motioned to the other side of his plush library, lined with mahogany and velvet furnishings. A tiny fire in the center of the room warmed the space adding to the magic of it. On the other side of the room, stunning artworks hung in massive frames. They were names Pierre recognized, famous painters whose work could often be found in museums. The color of the paintings were vastly different from the ocean. They were a mosaic of vibrant greens, of flashy pinks, of deep blues. Each swath of color seemed to be more stunning than the last. Beneath the paintings, sheet music was carefully displayed. Pierre couldn't help but page through title after title. They were some of the finest songs ever composed a treasure trove of life-changing music. And then, of course, there were the animals. Scientific specimens from the deep were peppered throughout the library, fueling the scientist inside of Pierre. Some were creatures he had never seen before. Surely creatures that explored distant or deep waters far beyond what humans could reach. Though he was captive aboard the Nautilus, he had never felt more enlightened or excited. His thirst for knowledge outweighed everything else. His love of France, his life before he stepped aboard the ship. Nemo treated Pierre to another fine, several-course meal. Each dish was plucked from the ocean all around them. The divinely decorated dishes tasted even better than they looked. They were succulent, each one a treat that few people in the world would ever be able to experience. Pierre was utterly enthralled. There was nothing more remarkable than this. Seeing Pierre's desire for knowledge rising, Nemo sat him down and explained the basics. The Nautilus ran on electricity, which powered everything from the engines 
to the drinking water. All of the electricity came from the water all around them, specifically from the minerals in the seawater. Pierre could not find words. He fumbled for a moment, stunned by the scientific endeavors the Nautilus had taken on. Pierre returned to the company of his friends, a new, enlightened man. He spoke to them about the wondrous things he had just learned, about the knowledge that Nemo and his crew possessed, but nothing could have prepared him for the beauty that awaited him. Because soon, the lights of the submarine flickered off. In the still darkness, Pierre found himself frozen in one of those moments of peace again. But within seconds, the darkness was parted by a beautiful light. The sides of the Nautilus opened, revealing the ocean beyond through panes of thick glass. Lights illuminated the sea all around them, giving Pierre, Ned, and Conseil their first glimpse of what was truly beneath the waves. It was breathtaking. Schools of fish breezed by as if they were one unit. Their silver and blue scales caught each passing ray of light, making it look as though they were sparkling. The motion of the fish was equally mesmerizing. They almost seemed to dance with each other, sailing through the currents on pure instinct and camaraderie compared to anything else. Sea turtles seemed to move in slow motion through the waves. Their large shells didn't detract from the beauty of their movements. Their long, sleek flippers cut through the water in long, calculated swoops that propelled them on and on. When Pierre looked into the eyes of the sea turtle, he swore that the turtle was looking back at him. And then there was the world below them. This close to the shore, they could make out the world of plant life on the bottom of the craggy sea. Starfish clung to rock. Coral glistened in the sun, filtering down through the waves. Crabs scuttled from rock to rock through the dancing kelp. It was more beautiful than Pierre had ever dreamed. For the whole afternoon, the three crewmates sat and watched the ocean glide by them. They mostly sat in awed silence. The energy buzzing between them said more than words ever could. Soon it was time for dinner. As they ate another succulent meal, they found themselves daydreaming of the ocean they had just come to know in a whole new light. As Pierre laid his head down on his pillow in his cabin for the very first time. He didn't feel like a captive. There was much to learn on the Nautilus and many more beautiful things to see. I hope you've enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please. Join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>